Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We are going to deal with a very important topic. Uh, this is the green supply chain design. Uh, you know, there is this um, topic of green uh, everywhere, and also this is also about the climate change. And uh, there is a lot of uh, literature, talk, Nobel prizes, and so on, on climate change. But the fundamental thing that we are going to deal with in the next four lectures including this is about how do you design a green supply chain. What do you mean by as we know the supply chain means uh, is, is the end product of a supply chain is any product or a service. So if you want the product to be green that is it meets all the specifications of um, uh, uh, the uh, the green uh, parameters. Then, how do you design such a supply chain? It's not only the product, the design, but also the processes on which the product is manufactured. They have to be green. So, this this is the uh, difficult task. That's uh, what we are going to uh, deal with in green supply chain design in the next three or four lectures. <coughs> well, the one quotation is to meet the present needs without compromising the future. Future. So, the the, the idea of uh, this statement is that you basically um, have industries like fertilizers or cement or uh, pharmaceuticals or or even food, but all this. Or they are to meet the present needs. They give you products and services that present uh, that give the present need. But what happens with them is while producing the manufacturing processes also produce greenhouse gases. They produce lot of pollutants. So all this actually are going to have affect the atmosphere. In other words. It is compromising the future because the future water is polluted, the future atmosphere is polluted. That increases the uh, the global. It cre creates global warming and all the associated problems uh, with that. So the idea here is uh, to meet the needs of the present without compromising the future. In other words, you want to. You want you want to use only so much of resources that are needed. You don't want to pollute the atmosphere. You want to recycle the materials. You want to basically reduce the amount of carbon content in your in your atmosphere. So, with all this, if you add to your supply chain design <coughs> of meeting the uh, the demand supply matching. All these factors, like use less resources, use it should generate less carbon content. It should generate less uh, pollutants. It should uh, be it should be recycling. The products that you create should be recyclable, and the processes, manufacturing processes that you have, should be able to use the recycled materials. So, all this is is basically about green supply chain design, which makes, of course, the supply chain design tough, and that is what we are going to deal with uh, in the next three lectures. <coughs> so the contents are uh, <coughs> the first two lectures are sustainable development. What do we mean by sustainable development and what is the difference between conventional and green supply chains? This is an important topic because there are standard methodologies that are available for conventional supply chain design. There are software packages available, optimization, then ERP, Oracle, SAP, and a lot of companies would supply the 
uh, the software packages. But how do, what is the difference between both of them and how do you talk about what are green supply chains and what are the methodologies of uh, uh, designing a green supply chain. And there is what is called emission trading. There are two popular methodologies. One is <coughs> the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the in the from design to use end use uh, uh, methodology. The other one is you want to do uh, carbon trading. And what are the sustainability in, in, in indices or initiatives in practice? In other words, what is the the uh, the status of the industry today. So, we will uh, come through some examples and finally conclude this. So, what we are going to do is an introduction to the green supply chain design. Although we do not design the supply chain, we will do that in the next class, but in this we will get the fundamentals of sustainable development and green supply chains. So, what is sustainable development? <coughs> What is sustainability? It is the most often quoted definition of sustainability is development that needs that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So, in other words, while you are doing your work do not compromise the work of the future generations. This is this is basically uh, often quoted uh, uh, definition and it is from Birkland Commission of World Commission on Environment and Development, Our Common Future in 1987. And from that time onwards this is often quoted and that became a standardized definition of what sustainability means. So, it development that me that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Now, in the case of supply chains, which is our topic today, we are going to do development of present products without compromising the resources, without compromising the atmosphere, without compromising on uh, the, uh, the, the products uh, and so on. So, basically that is what it means in our context. There is also what is called as the triple bottom line. The triple bottom line is social, economic and environmental, the people, planet and profit. And the phrase was coined by John Elkington in 1995. The book Cannibals with Forks, the triple bottom line of 21st century business social performance indicators. That is the book by, uh, by John and in 1995. And the triple bottom line is another uh, uh, three words that are very famous in sustainability. So, here you can see there is social need that you need to feed the people for create, create food for people. You need to uh, give them uh, all the conveniences, house, then vehicles and uh, other services like IT and all that. And you have to improve the economy, in other words the agriculture, manufacturing and services and also you have to keep your environment so clean. So, the, the issue is the three social, the, uh, the three triple bottom line, is it, is it possible to meet all of them or when you meet one or two of them, the other gets compromised. Let us see this. So, uh, the definition of sustainable development is adopting business strategies and activities that meets of the enterprise and its stakeholders while protecting, sustaining, enhancing the human and natural resources that will be needed in the future. So, that is basically the definition for an enterprise. And here is the triple bottom line that we, this one, the strategic focus here is we want to focus on environmental protection, we want to protect, look at the social well-being, we want to look at economic development. So, in other words, you have the three circles, economic development, social well-being and environmental protection. Now, you can see that 
where do all the three circles meet in this small area maximum benefit focus area that is the area where you have the triple bottom line that is met this area. This is the area where the triple bottom line is met. But you can see most of the time if you want to develop industries for economic development and also provide jobs for all these uh, all the people that is for social well being these two objectives means that you have to develop industries. So, once you have developed industries you have to move materials you have to basically uh, have production processes and so on and which means you have to use resources like water, forest, uh, power and so on and that means the, the you are using uh, some of the environmental products here. So, you can probably change the biodiversity you can also uh, remove some of the forest to make uh, either agriculture or, or a, or a uh, manufacturing plants and also you may you may generate lot of gases while using transportation for moving materials so you can see that when you are meeting these two objectives then the environment gets spoiled that that is the this one. For example, these two any government wants economic development and social well being and environmental protection nowadays has become uh, a priority area and so on. So, if you want to meet all the three objectives, if you want to meet all the three objectives then your focus area becomes limited, but that is what we are going to deal with here. So, if you look at this is the triple bottom line that we are talking about where you want enterprises that meet both economic development, social well being and environmental protection. So, what is the challenge managing economic growth while reducing the use of resources and the pace of emissions growth. So, you want to you want economic growth you want social well being, but you want to use a minimal amount of resources and also emit as less emissions as possible that is the definition of sustainable development. So, what are greenhouse gases and the carbon footprint? So, gases that trap heat in the atmosphere are called greenhouse gases. The principal greenhouse gases that enter the atmosphere because of the human activities are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and fluorinol gases, fluorinated gases. These are the these are all called carbon footprint and the carbon footprint refers to the total amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases emitted over the entire life cycle of a product or a service. So, if you generate an automobile, so if you take an automobile from design till the production of the automobile, what is the kind of carbon footprint? And from once the automobile starts functioning, you have to have petrol and other things and it emanates a lot of gases when it goes on the roads and so on. So, what is the carbon footprint of the automobile? Any transportation device whether it is a car or a truck or this one has actually it emanates a lot of GHG gases. So, that becomes the entire life cycle of the product or service. If you are taking for example, information technology IT services in storage. Now, if you are storing data in, in servers and that requires power and which means that the, the data storage is not easy and it, there are a lot of gases that come in out of this. So, if you want to minimize the amount of um, power that is used the amount of carbon that uh, carbon footprint of a server system then you have to carefully choose and have their methodologies available for that. So, for each product you have a carbon footprint and for each service there is a carbon footprint. For example, your travel there is a carbon footprint. If you come from home to office there is a carbon footprint. So, if you want to minimize that carbon footprint well uh, instead of coming on a car if you walk then there is a minimal if you bicycle then there is a you are minimizing the carbon footprint. If you take a shared 
share tap instead of coming your, in your own car, then you are minimizing the carbon footprint. So, basically there are several ways in which you can, this one instead of using a gasoline car, if you use electric car, then you are minimizing the carbon footprint. So, there are several ways in which this uh, carbon footprint can be minimized. So, what are the conventional versus green supply chains here? Yeah. The conventional supply chains are the conventional supply chain management plans, implements and controls the operations of supply chain as efficiently as possible. So, in other words, if you, if you look at uh, the earlier supply chain designs, you want it to be low cost, you want to meet the customer needs, you want to minimize as much less inventory as possible and you want everything to be just in time and you want high quality products and so that is the kind of thing that. So, but to do this to, to maintain this kind of efficiency in your supply chain, you basically ignore the wastage, the pollution, the high energy uses, traffic congestion and other environmental damages and the associated social and economic costs. So, you are talking of industry, you have the your supply chain efficiency and that supply chain efficiency basically to give products at a lower cost to your customers, but you are ignoring, you are using more resources, you are wasting lot of resources and also there are lot of associated social and economic costs. So, the common method of inventory reduction in JIT, JIT is just in time. What is just in time? Just in time means you do not keep any inventory in the factory from the suppliers all the material comes as you need it. In other words, if you have a batch of products you are manufacturing in the morning, you get that much batch for in the morning by a truck and whatever is needed for the afternoon, you will get another truck which is coming. So, basically you will deliver in small batches. When you deliver these things in small batches, it means more deliveries. So, whether the truck is full or not, you are going to deliver more, more, more number of times, which means more fuel consumption and more traffic congestion, congestion and more GHG gases. So, the efficiency of uh, uh, the supply chain, which is JIT, which is followed universally everywhere, then that creates problems more and more uh, GHG gases and efficient supply chains, JIT, just in time, does not mean that the supply chain is green. So, and then another uh, factor that uh, is very common uh, is outsourcing. What, what, uh, what are people doing nowadays instead of manufacturing in their own countries, they are outsourcing to low cost countries. So, the low cost countries are viewed as the best places to acquire manufactured goods and services. This means China, Vietnam, Thailand and so on. So, basically all the United States products are made in these places and they are, they are shipped to the United States or Europe. So, companies underemphasize the impact of costs, other costs such as raw materials, transportation and energy and other and are committed with long term contracts. So, for example, you want iron ore. So, iron ore comes from Brazil, India and, uh, 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 and goes to China now or, or Japan. So, basically when iron ore gathers, it has to be shipped and uh, the ship has to travel over the seas for 10, 000, tens of thousands of miles and which means that you are emitting lot of green gases. So, but what about the cost of uh, uh, cost of transport? Below? Although it is low cost at in India or Brazil, but when it comes to, to comes to China or the United States, you have to add the transportation cost, the cost of spoiling the environment, and all that. If you do all this, then the cost advantage that you may have may disappear. So most of the times, the so-called outsourcing has been the people who are looking at only the cost, unit cost in the place where they are buying it or they are manufacturing it. So, 
So, for example, bridging ships across the Pacific, across the Pacific, 17 percent of the iron ore that China uses to make produce for Americas. So, what, uh, what China does is it, it actually imports uh, uh, iron ore and it makes products, uh, it can be refrigerators, it can be automobiles, it can be anything and it uh, actually these products are all imported and exported to the United States again. So, if you add up the incremental transport, energy, inventory expenses for such transshipment, China's labor cost advantage disappears. So, in other words, you, 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 if you add up all the ecosystem costs, then the, the transaction costs, then it will disappear. Product is moving extra 10,000 miles without making any significant benefit, either cost or quality. So, you are not shipping any value, any product and while shipping also you are not making any value addition. So, that is the kind of problem that you, that people have in terms of the outsourcing. Now, companies with the advent of uh, uh, the, the green initiatives, the companies are thinking local. What do you mean by this? A leading electronic company that used to make all its products in US, uh, all its US bound products in China is now moved uh, more than half its worth of Mexico. So, basically transportation miles have fallen by 80 percent and inventories and supply chain risk are reduced. So, it need not have to be shipped, it need not have the travel time has reduced. So, the inventory on ships as well as the inventory that people have to keep because of for the uncertainties in, in the travel times, uh, the standard deviation of the standard times, they have all come down. So, more and more companies from Europe are sourcing from Turkey and Near East rather than from Far East. So, there is a, some kind of uh, uh, awakening in terms of the companies. When you are doing JIT in the name of efficiency, then you are spending, you are basically spending a lot more on transportation which evolves as GHG gases. You are causing traffic congestion. And when you are outsourcing in the name of low cost, uh, uh, low cost, acquiring low cost products from low cost countries. So, you are actually spoiling the atmosphere by, by, by uh, emitting GHG gases through ships, through the transportation and so on. So, that is the kind of uh, this one that is happening. More and more companies are favoring shorter supply chain markets. So, why are you, why are people implementing uh, the green supply chain? Organizations may have reactive regulatory reasons. In other words, there are every country almost is regulating saying that whatever products that they are making has to be green, whatever services they are providing have to be green and they calculate what is called the carbon footprint and their taxes, what are called carbon tax and all that. So, there are regulatory reasons. Uh, for the companies and raising prices of energy and raw materials. So, the raw materials for example, the resources like iron ore or uh, 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 cement or uh, clinker and all that, they, they are increasing because the <coughs> over time for the past century people have been using this and uh, the resources have, have, uh, have diminished. So, the price of energy and raw materials have increased. So, people want to reuse the materials and also or reduce or make the efficiency as much as possible and prior to strategic and competitive advantage reasons. If you, if you say that I am green and if your products are green, then you may have a competitive advantage because the customers, sensitive customers to green may go for a green product rather than, rather than other non-green products. So, waste and emissions caused by the supply chain have become the main source of serious environmental problems including global warming and asset chain. So, green supply chain emphasizes the minimum consumption of resources and energy and minimum environmental impact. 
that's basically the fundamental thing use as little resources are possible recycle as much of the product uh, discarded product as possible and use have minimum environmental impact. Green supply chain adds a close group of material or recycler function and the reuse of products or parts and the recycling of material. Recycling not only increases utilizing ratio of resources, it increases the recycling utilize utility ratio of resources. So, how do you estimate uh, GHD and uh, uh, estimation and reduction? What is the supply chain approach? Reducing carbon emissions. The carbon footprint of a product is the carbon dioxide emitted across the supply chain for a single unit of the product. So, the carbon footprint of cola is the total amount of uh, carbon dioxide emitted to produce, use, and dispose a single item of cola. So, if you take a Coca Cola, you have to you put, if you have an aluminum can, how much is the carbon footprint to produce the aluminum can? How much is the the, so the liquid uh, cola liquid uh, this one? How much is uh, for manufacturing? How much is for storage in the refrigerator before you actually drink it? How much is it for disposing it off? So, if you add all this, that will you will get the foot, foot, uh, footprint of cola. It helps communities to understand the carbon emissions across their supply chains. So, if you map the carbon footprint, then the it will understand the carbon emissions across the supply chain, allow them to prioritize areas where reduction in emissions can be achieved. So, if you look at the entire supply chain, then there could be some areas where you can possibly reduce the carbon footprint. Supposing you are producing an automobile, you are you are basically having a lot of automobile components. Supposing you procure all the automobile components from some other country, then you know, uh, and then those those companies are also green. Then you are reducing the footprint. While while if you come by ship while bringing the material to this one, then you are reducing the footprint. So if your manufacturing process is green. Are reducing the number of emissions and so on, then it is green. So, you can basically look at the entire supply chain, then you can see where your reductions are possible. Sometimes reductions may not be possible. Supposing your electricity that is supplied to your factory is from a coal, this one. So, the number, the amount of emissions that for using the power, it is called scope 3 additions, uh, emissions, you cannot do anything with them. So, you have to basically find out the areas where you can reduce. It helps the business to make better informed decisions in design, manufacturing, sourcing, distribution and disposal of products considering the costs and liabilities that exist whatever, whenever carbon emissions are generated. So, basically you have to, if you look take the supply chain approach then you basically have a better informed decision. So, for a, let us take some examples, look at some examples. Supposing you look at water content in potato, does it value? In other words, if you take potatoes, uh, ordinary potatoes that you eat every day, then the there is lot of water content in them because otherwise the potato gets dry and it gets sad, so it gets spoiled. So, potato purchased by weight, that is what all of us do, you buy either kilograms or pounds or whatever and it is uh, it's dollars per ton of potatoes. But what happens is usually potatoes are stored in humidified warehouses which increases the water content because the potato absorbs the water content and it increases the water content. And actually that water content actually increases the weight of the potato which the farmers basically since it is sold uh, by weight the farmers are happy about it because they get more money. But what happens is when you are using the humidifiers large amounts of energy, you are using large amounts of energy and you generate significant emissions. Now, supposing you are using the potato to make fries. 
So, frying is used to drive off the moisture in a sliced potato. So, extra moisture in potato increases frying time as well as frying emissions. So, if you look at the left hand side, the current status is that you have potatoes and if you want them uh, you know, to remain fresh, you need to keep its water content and water content is the one that, that uh, shows whether the potato is good or bad and you humidify it to keep the water content high and that means you are adding more emissions to the atmosphere and also while frying the potato to drive out the moisture you are again uh, emitting extra gases, GHG gases. But supposing we have an opportunity, supposing pair uh, twice varies by the water content reward farmers for producing potatoes with low water content. In other words, do not put them in humidifier atmospheres, get them in temperatures, find storage methods without, humidi uh, without humidifiers to basically keep the potatoes safe and good. And no commercial incentive to humidify the potatoes and farmer saves energy bill and emissions. and no need to drive off excess water when you are frying it save on energy bill and emissions. So, basically if you declare that low water content potatoes are high quality potatoes and you reward the farmers accordingly, then you are saving the gases. So, this is this is the an important example of a supply chain after the poor post harvest potatoes that uh, you can see. So, it says the overall supply chain can save up to 9200 tons of CO2 and 1.2 pound 2 million pounds per annum by changing the way potatoes are traded. So, let us look at the carbon content of, of a cola. Suppose you have a coca cola, but the raw material is uh, for the coca cola can is aluminum and you require sugar farming and refining that is the raw materials and you have the product manufacturing the cola production and packaging and distribution and retail which is transportation and chill storage and a consumer use uh, you put it in the refrigerator and disposal is can collection recycling. So, if you look at the total uh, carbon footprint for cola then you will find that the raw material has this percentage. And whereas distribution and retail is this, consumer use is this and disposal and recycling is this. So, you may think that you are basically disposing of you may save aluminum while recycling, but you are spending the carbon. So, the total carbon content here is not only from the raw material and manufacturing, but is also in distribution and retail and you can see the consumer use is more than distribution and retail because you keep it in the refrigerator to keep the uh, to keep the cola cold and also disposal and recycling. So, here if you want to look at uh, the percentages, uh, the these are the kinds of percentages that, that you get in and so, the uh, you, if, you, if, you, if you look at here, if you want to save on this, you can ask people, you need not have to refrigerate, you save so much of uh, this one. If you are basically find a cheaper way of disposal and recycling, you can save here and of course, in manufacturing and, uh, and distribution and all that. There are some carbon amount of carbon printed that is unavoidable, but there are some which you can avoid. And also, if you can do the holistic analysis of end to end supply chain, you may have better reduction of the emissions. For example, you are buying roses in UK. There are two alternatives, one grown in Netherlands and the other in Kenya. So, the, the, the popular belief is that the one flower from Netherlands will be more economical, eco friendly as it would have traveled less miles than Kenya. Right, you are buying this all this business in UK. So, the Netherlands um, roaches 
are more eco friendly. But if you look at if you look at the entire supply chain, that if you look at the how roses are produced, roses from Netherlands require artificial light, heat and cooling for an 8 to 12 week growing cycle. Whereas natural weather in Kenya favored the roses without uh, any temperature regulator. So in Netherlands you have to keep it in an artificial this one you spend a lot of energy and the grease, greenhouse gases for this. So if we add all this research reveals that 12,000 cut stems of roses from Kenya emitted 2200 kg of CO2 whereas that of Dutch operation emits 35,000 kg of CO2. So basically you know the, the kind is it is not just the transportation or the final distribution that you, you have to look at the manufacturing process. If it is a rose how it is produced and all that. When you do all this it may be it may be that you may find that uh, the the uh, tables are reversed. What you thought that uh, because Netherlands is closer to UK. So, the who thought it was more eco friendly to get it from New Zealand, but New the Netherlands, but Netherlands has uh, because of soil conditions and all that it has to do in artificial atmosphere which requires a lot of uh, energy. And similarly, if you look at uh, the finished Welsh logistics in India, it is they have the uh, they have a need for an orchestrator. The, the situation is this, in India the auto industry is clustered around the edges. It is in Chennai in south, Mumbai in west and Jamshedpur in east and Gurgaon in north and the demand is distributed across the entire nation. So you have at the forks you have the production facilities and whereas you have the, uh, the demand at the entire nation. And so you can see there are there are producers of automobiles in the south and they sell cars to the north. Whereas there are automobile produ producers or motorbikes producers in Gurgaon which is Delhi, but they, they also market in the south, west, in east and so on. So green collaborative logistics among OEMs for moving the finished vehicles from factories to the retailers is possible. Now here what happens is if you look at these are finished vehicle logistics. Finished vehicle logistics is very expensive that is because the vehicle takes 10 days from north to south and it has to return empty. So on the other hand suppose a while coming it, it, it does not carry anything because there is no collaborative logistics. Supposing while going it takes the vehicles from north to the south and while coming it picks up from southern manufacturers bring them to north then you are doing uh, doing a good job of collaborative logistics. So a truck carrying finished vehicles from a factory to the south to a retailer in the north of India usually returns empty. The emissions and cost could be optimized if truck carries vehicles from a factory in north to the retailer in south. In other words you they, they do both ways by proper planning. For example, Indian railway network can be leveraged for nationwide vehicle distribution with reduced emissions because anyway the railroad is uh, less uh, is more green than uh, than the trucks. So that so what the Indian finished vehicle logistics means uh, is that it needs uh, an orchestrator, an outside body who can basically look at the railways which can have uh, the finished well logistics providers and it can it is an outsider who is an orchestrator he deals with all the OEMs for vehicle logistics. There will be more economies of scale as well as uh, uh, it is green uh, this one. So basically when you look at the entire uh, 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 logistics or the entire supply chain then you get lot of uh, you get lot of uh, uh, advantages in terms of this one. So basically there when when you are talking of uh, the, the, the supply chain uh, this one then you talk of three scopes of GHG protocol. This is JHG stands for the 
Now here you have you have the three things here, the three scopes of GHD gases. So you have your own scope one. That is, this is your factory, and you produce all these gases, CH4 uh, and sulfur, carbon dioxide, and all that. Now, when you have uh, your electricity, the power that generates for your factory, that is scope two. In other words, you may not generate this electricity, but it could be somebody else who is supplying power for you. If it is coal fired or it is hydro or it is solar, whatever it is, it has some GHG gas associated, associated with it. So, that is called scope 2 and scope 3 is the, the rest. In other words, in the supply chain, you have suppliers who have basically the GHG gases in their production process. They supply to you through through either trucks or train or, or air or whatever, then there are GHG gases associated with that and so on. So, you have three scopes, you are on this one, then your power GHG gases and the ones for the rest of your supply chain. Direct emissions are those that occur from sources that are owned or controlled by the reporting entity, including the industrial activities or any on-site energy production. In other words, if you are having your own power plant, then that comes under scope 1. If you look at scope 2, there are indirect emissions that result from activities of a reporting entity, but occur at sources owned or controlled by another entity. In other words, the reporting entity that occur, the emissions that result from activities of the reporting entity, but occur at sources owned or controlled by another such as purchase, electricity, heat or steam and so on. And we have two scope 3 this one are all other emissions associated with companies activities that are not included in scopes 1 and 2 such as emissions associated with employee travel extraction and processing of raw materials and their transportation to the company, the shipment of company's products to distribution centers, retailers, customers and product disposal. So, this is scope 3 includes all others. So, basically people talk about scope 1, their own and they say talk about their carbon emissions, but it is important one looks at all the scopes 1, 2, uh, this one. So, the basic assumption behind carbon there what are called carbon offset schemes. What are carbon offset schemes? Supposing you are generating carbon and there is somebody else which is generating the carbon, you are generating this carbon, you offset it by having a solar plant or a windmill. Then you know as much as this is removed from your carbon footprint. In other words, whatever you are saving because of this solar energy or because of the wind uh, windmills, whatever is energy is removed from you and that is calculated as your carbon uh, GHG, uh, carbon footprint. So, your own carbon footprint plus whatever you have created to avoid the carbon footprint indirectly through other energy sources that is actually removed, it is offset and this becomes your carbon footprint. So, let us look at it, global warming is a global problem, what is the idea here? In other words, you can basically produce all these gases, say in one country, you can have a solar or a windmill in another country, but so, but still it is all calculated as per this formula. So, global warming is a global problem. What matters for the climate is overall greenhouse concentrations in the atmosphere and it is a problem of quantity.
So, it does not matter where emissions are reduced as long as they are reduced. So, in other words you can be have this plant in India polluting in India and this you can have in, in Antarctica and then also you get this benefits. So, it looks strange, but that is what it is. So, this is what is called carbon offsets. So, most offset projects are carried out in sectors of the economy that do not have legal obligation to achieve a reduction target, but where cuts in greenhouse gas emissions are cheaper than in sectors where emission limits with emission limits. Most carbon offset projects are located in global south. In other words, most of these offset projects are located in global south. So, there are two popular methodologies for uh, uh, green uh, methodologies. One is what is called a cradle to cradle protocol. That means, from birth to death to rebirth and another one is the carbon trading. So, let us look at uh, this one. If you look at the supply chain here, it starts with suppliers and there are OEMs so original equipment manufacturers, there is a B2B logistics that happens between them and you have distributors and there is logistics associated with this and you have uh, retailers and customers and so on, there is B2C logistics here, business to customer logistics chain. So, the logistics are different, but everything has the carbon footprint. Your suppliers are carbon footprint, logistics have carbon footprint, your OEMs have carbon footprint and so on. So, this is the what is called the forward supply chain. So, you have this forward supply chain and whenever the customer has disposes this or he has a repair to be done, it goes to what is called a service center and service center gets the spare parts from the suppliers and the manufacturers and services this product and it, it gives back to the supplier to the customer. Now, this the service center could be treated as a refurbishing station where it collects all the uh, disposed of items and it can do refurbishing or it can do uh, disposal and so on. So, basically this is a cradle to cradle protocol in the sense that you are producing, designing and producing something and using all these materials, uh, uh, materials back again into this is called a remanufacturing and so on. So, the, the sustainable supply chain uses environmentally friendly inputs and transforms them into outputs that can be reclaimed and reused at the end of their life cycle. So, first of all there are two points here. The first point is you have this forward supply chain and when you dispose it off you give it and then use the use it for the material it does. That is one point recycling. The second point is you make your uh, you have to design this product so that as much of material that you have used is reclaimable. So, that is the fundamental problem here. In other words, your green design is not ordinary design. Green design has to be designed in such a fashion such most of the material that you have used in this you can reclaim it. So, then it becomes a cradle to cradle protocol. So, you have a cradle to cradle protocol here which is a sustainable supply chain uses environmentally friendly inputs and transforms them into outputs that can be reclaimed and reused at the end of their life cycle without existing uh, within the existing environment. So, if you look at uh, this one, you have uh, the raw material, you have the virgin material, you have fabrication, assembly, customer and what happens here is the um, whatever comes as a waste. In other words, as you are using the raw material, you convert it to a product, there is a waste. And similarly, in the virgin material waste, fabrication, there is a waste, assembly, there is a waste and so on. All this, you try to reduce the waste. 
in other words make your products as efficiently as possible so that you reduce the waste. This waste could be the inspection if you are making products which are not good then you know they have to be dismantled and the, during the inspection and also you are using the energy here in all these processes you have to minimize the amount of energy that you use and there is the process design there is the product design. Now products are to be designed so that your product your whatever you get out of this can be reused remanufactured recycled and when you dispose. So, in other words you want to minimize the amount of disposal the amount of useless material you want to use as much as possible for this so that after the reuse it goes back to assembly after refabrication it goes back to uh, this one after recycling it goes back to the to the to this material. So, you have the raw material plus this recycled material which you gets into the factory here. So, the, the point here is that you have what is called the B2B, B2C logistics, but there is what is called reverse logistics. The reverse logistics is the one that you use the recycling and remanufacturing and reusing and all this and so on. So, basically a green, uh, a green sustainable supply chain to cradle to cradle protocol is sort of environmentally friendly and transforms inputs into outputs that can be reclaimed and reused. So, that becomes a part of the design and it is also called the cradle to cradle protocol. So, what we will do is we will continue this lecture later.